of yours. Hit that one more time. I am, I am the, the number one determinant, number one determinant of, the success of the success or failure. Or failure. Here we go. Of my, of my student. Hey, y'all, you have a strong summer. Kick some butt next year. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you. That's the mindset. That's the attitude. Love you guys. And we are live. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Come on in. Come on in. You know, we call King Day the holiday, but I call King Day the birthday. That's how I've been doing it ever since. So come on in on this King Day, January 15th. 2022 come on in come on in let me know where you're coming from as you come in let's see who we got on here and i should say welcome to the virtual ap leadership academy week number 90 yeah i said 90 this thing was supposed to be 18 weeks but it's 90 we got ricardo Giannis in the building dr Roz gaskins is in the building demetrius scott my man cynthia farmer is here michael thomas is here John Herricks, Rodney Williams, Arcella Austri is in the building. Dot Makita G McKeep Mc, Dot McKeever Jeter, the principal, is in the building. Lily Lanier, Rachel Wells, Garfar, WT. You gotta tell me what that WT stands for one day. Thomasine Star Hamilton's in the building. Michael Benton. Hey Benton, you are you a Bengals fan? Big game today. Big game. I heard that Cincinnati is lit right now. I'll be watching. 4 30. We got Melina uh Valentine in the building. Know who that this year. Let's go. Venice Lewis is in the building. <laughs> Lady J is in the building. My man Vincent Stallings. Hey, you got one game, Stallings, but you know San Francisco gonna run you and my guest out of town, right? So that <laughs> we got Brandy Callahan in the building. Uh, Cami Berry, Veronica Romero, Cynthia Farmer, Rodney Richardson is in the building. Byrian Collins, Tommy Vincent Hilliard is in the building. Lysandra Brackens, they're all here. Sher uh, Sherrod Lamont Laws is in the building. Principal Tammy Taylor from South Carolina in the building. The Queen, Kimberly Broughton Cafele is in the building. Corinth, uh, Corinthia, Denise Dixie's in the building. Sheikah Houston getting ready to lay it down in South Carolina Alliance of Black School Educators today. She's widening her neck, man. She getting ready to lay it down doing this conference. If you out there in South Carolina, I don't know what town is in, but you better get the scabsy and check her out. We got uh, my man Otis Kitchen in the building, principal down there in the warm climate. He down there in Tampa. See, it's 13 degrees up here, Otis Kitchen, 13 on my phone. But it's what, what's it where you are, 80? You getting ready to go swimming? <laughs> we got uh, Trenisha Gilbert in the building, Louis Saunders, my man, Hovet. Great morning to you back. It's probably warm where you are too down there in Alabama. Monica Welch is in the building. Alicia Gibson, Suzanne. Uh, oh man, I'm getting ready to butcher your name. Eliza, uh, Eliza Aris, Adam. I tried. Lawanda Dixon, Merlene. She's she, Mer, Mer, Merlina. What am I saying, man? Merlina Valentine. She said she said ninety. Wow. I need I need to move out there down south somewhere. Crystal. Nolan Brandon's in the building. Cheryl Lynn's in the building. Renee Graham's in the building. KB. Oh, no, no, no. Marlina didn't say 90 for temperature. I know it ain't 90 in, in New Orleans. You said 90 for weeks, I think. Yeah, I got you now. I got you. I got you. Appreciate you, too. Lori Phillips. Phillips Houston's in the building. Oh, man, it's about 11. I got to get going. Lisa B. Woods. Herman's in the building. Tamika Sumter. Hit the share button, folks. Hit the retweet. Let them know, man. We, you know, we we focusing on King today. 
got a big time guest in the wing. So let me say to you first and foremost, formally, good morning. Greetings. Welcome to week 90. Can you believe that, man? Now, the people who are new, you know, that, that may not mean as much to you, but the ones that have been rocking with me since May of 2020, and I haven't missed a Saturday, week 90 of the virtual AP Leadership Academy. And as I always say, I don't know about you. I mean, I kind of think I know, but but I, I got to speak for myself on this one real quick. I just want you to know how I feel. I think you kind of feel the energy right now because I'm a little hyped, right? But I, but I want you to know how I feel. I'm on fire! That's how I feel, y'all. I'm blazing. I'm feeling good. Got my Detroit Stars Negro League jersey on, man. I put these things on and I feel like I'm Superman every Saturday. I only wear these on the broadcast, but I feel like it takes me up a level because I'm wearing these jerseys of some of the best baseball players that ever play baseball. But because they were born black, they weren't allowed to play in the major leagues. So they had to form leagues, about seven of them, just so they could play professional. So when I put these on, I feel like Superman. But I'm saying that to say to you, you chose leadership. And, and because you chose leadership, despite the pandemic, despite whatever the challenges are in the world, you have still got to be on fire. Woo! That's how I'm feeling. Let me jump into this motivational message real quick. Hit that hit that share button, somebody. Hit that retweet button, somebody. Let them know, man, I'm blazing. My message is a Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. quote on his birthday today, January 15. It says, we must remember that intelligence is not enough. He said, intelligence plus character, that is the goal of true education. Again, he said intelligence plus character is the goal of true education. So, so here, as I put it in this short message before we jump in, I'm asking you, under your leadership, what role does character play? What role does character development play? What role does ensuring that children understand the difference between right and wrong, good and bad? making good decisions versus bad decisions, doing the right thing when no one's watching. That is the that is the major, the epitome of character, knowing to, what to do, the right thing to do when nobody is peeping you, see, when nobody is watching. That's the epitome of character. I want to be the same guy 24-7. Right. So character, I'm just asking you the question, what role does it play in the leadership that you provide at your school or those of you who are aspiring the leadership that you will provide at your school one day? Right. Let's keep it going. Oh, I see my man, Principal Hurt, checked in. So I see you there, Sean Hurt. Good to see you. Great broadcast today. And we're going to talk about that as well. So so let's go to it, y'all. Quick announcements real quick and then we get into it. Um, um, the, the ASCD Virtual Leadership Summit is this week, the 18th. I am the opening keynoter. I'm blessed for that. Um, so that so please register, ASCD.org. That'll be the 18th, whatever day that is, right? The, I think that's Tuesday. I'll be the opening keynote. I don't know what time. Just register and you'll see it all at ASCD.org. I'll be sitting right here, right? Secondly, work all the first timers. First time on the broadcast on the live stream. Welcome. Don't that don't let this be your last time. Hang with us for forever because that's how long I'll be doing this. As long as long as I got breath, I'll be doing this broadcast, right? So hang with us. We in week 90. One day I'll be saying it's week 300. One day I'll be saying it's week 500, right? We just keep it going. I got no reason to stop. I got a whole generation that's sitting in elementary classrooms right now, sitting in high school classrooms right now, who eventually one day will be leaders. And guess what? I'm going to live to be 100, so I'll still be on here talking to that next generation or next generations. So welcome to the first timers. Uh, my, new, my new platform, School Talk, man, I'm excited about it. 
make sure that you subscribe to my other channel called Principal Kefele Speaks to Educators. Again, Principal Kefele Speaks to Educators. <clears throat> That's the channel that I use for that. My next guest, Zaretta Hammond. She wrote the book, Cultural, Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain. It's, it's a blockbuster book that's still in the top 100 on Amazon after like seven, eight years of publication. It's, it's been around for a long time. So she'll be on with me on January 27th at 8 o'clock p.m. EST. That's January 27th on a Thursday, 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time. We had Dr. Donna Ford the other day. What an amazing uh, conversation we had. You want to see it? Go to the Principal uh, Cafele Speaks YouTube channel. Check it out. It's two hours long, though. And then all the other guests, I've had four on that platform now. Sunday Morning Commentary, always check it out on Sundays. My virtual AP Leadership Academy Facebook page with the new mess, the new commentary that I write. This an out. This this just an outgrowth of the conversation on Saturday. And then you know I gotta pump these, man. So, equity and social justice education fifty and the assistant principal fifty. You can get them wherever education books are sold. Amazon, Barnes and Noble, PrincipalCafele.com, wherever. But get your hands on both of them. You know, I wrote several more books than this. And I got to tell you, I got a new book I'm getting ready to write. I already told the publisher. I'm not even going to tell you what it is yet, but it's going to be relevant to a lot of you. But I uh, called the publisher last week. I said, yo, I got to get this book written. You know, so, so whenever I feel it, then, then it's time to write it. Having last week, this time, wasn't feeling a book. This week, right now, I got a book in me, right? So that's how it works. So I go with it. So that's that's my announcements. Hit the share button. Hit the retweet button. Let them know. We're here. We're here. I got a guest I'm going to bring up this morning. And um, Dynamite principal, Dynamite activist, Dynamite man. And uh, let me bring him up here before we get into the bio. And this is my man, my brother, principal, Chris Gadston from right here in Jersey City. I'm in Jersey City. He's in Jersey City. This is local this morning. My brother, good morning to you. Hey, good morning, Principal. Good morning, man. It's, it's an honor being here, man. It's an honor to have you this morning. Let me tell them who you are. Chris, Chris L. Gadston is the proud father of three beautiful girls and is married to his wife, Petal Gadston. Gadston is a graduate of New Jersey City University, as I am as well, where he received a bachelor's in sociology and history in St. Peter's University, where he received his master's in education administration and supervision in 2010. In 2016, Gaston made history becoming the first black Ward B councilman when he won a special election. Again, made history in 2016 when he became the first black Ward B. We got five wards in Jersey City. So he was the uh, six wards in Jersey City. So he was the Ward B councilman when he won that special election. Gaston is an educator in Jersey City Public Schools uh, for two decades and is currently the proud principal of Lincoln High School. His commitment to motivating students to succeed in building relationships within the school community has been recognized and appreciated by administrators, staff, parents, students, and the community. Gaston considers himself a servant leader. Let me say that again, a servant leader, and is very much concerned about the condition of his community. He has been a member of different social and civic groups, including the Jersey City chapter of the NAACP and the Royal Men Foundation. In his duty to contribute to the greatness of his city, because he has to repay his family, his friends, educators, community people, and leaders, who have made a difference in his life. Powerful biography, powerful introduction. So I'm honored to have my brother, Chris Gadston, here with us for however long it takes. You know, the goal is always an hour. This was meant to be a 11 to 12 live stream, Eastern Standard Time, but it's become a 11 to 11.30, 11, I mean, 11 to 12.30, 11 to, to one o'clock, you know, whatever it is. But look here, y'all, before we get into it, today's King Day. And you see, you, you, you see the title on the screen. So we we're gonna dive into King, but I'm not doing you know a documentary of, of Dr. King. I'm I'm gonna draw the parallels between King's words as it related to education and AP leadership and principal leadership. 
So before I, I start my questions, I want matter of fact, I can do this later. Let me let me go right to my let me go right to Chris. Chris, um, Principal Gaston, tell us, as an educator, who is Principal Chris Gaston? Well, you know, as a as my bio says, you know, like I'm I don't get caught up too much in titles, you know. I'm proud to be a principal and I'm proud to be the principal at Lincoln High School. Um, but I'm more so proud that I can serve humanity, right? So so I'm a I'm just a person who's who's just who just has to um, make sure that somebody else is better, make sure that somebody else is good. You know, I started this work. I was a part of a um, a group called AmeriCorps. Um, my early um, introduction into education was helping children, uh, homeless children, how to read uh, and write. And so I got inspired by that work. And I said, well, I need to be inside of the schoolhouse, right? So um, I attended NJCU. I started taking credits. I changed my master's at least three or four, uh, mm -hmm. changed my um, major at least three or four times. Uh, and then uh, I graduated. Um, I became a substitute teacher, teacher assistant, teacher, um, vice principal, principal, right? So throughout this whole time, you know, I've, I was, I'm very fortunate to do this work here in Jersey City, a place where I was born and raised. Yeah. So, you know, changing, trying to change the dynamics and trying to assist and try to help people to elevate their lives, it's an honor to me, right? And so that's who I really am, you know? Um, nothing too fancy, nothing um, all elaborate and things like that. I just like to just work, just work hard, make sure that I'm engaging with people, engaging with parents, engaging with the community, engaging with stakeholders, and uh, challenging everyone um, to make somebody else's life better because our central focus should be, you know, our kids and raising up a generation and raising up the next generation. I'm very fortunate to be an educator for about, you know, about 22 years and I'm starting to see a second generation, right? The children that you've taught yeah. now having children and now you're teaching them, right? So now we got to give them something different than, than what I gave somebody 20 years ago, you know? So that's Chris Gadsden. You know, I'm a little on window, so I'm going to keep my answers a little succinct. No, I, I, I love it. And, and, and see, that what's, what's key here, you said you, you just want to help make somebody better. That's it, right. I, I want the audience to hear that because that's that's really at, at, at the core of what we do. I just want to make somebody better. Right. Students, even staff, parents, community, whatever it is. So so my, my, my second question then is why? Why did you enter the, edu the, the the field of education and, and what continues to fuel your passion for this work? Well, I got into it because I started doing some self-reflecting when I was in college. And I and, I, you know, my my first initial um, uh, interaction with the educational system was a little bit selfish. Right. Because I already said because I said to myself, well, I want to give someone something that I didn't receive in my prior years, mm -hmm. you know, uh, like I'm a late bloomer. I didn't go to college directly after high school. I didn't do a lot of things, you know, right. Right. So I said, well, how can I fix this? You know, looking back at myself, what could have been done in my elementary school years? What could have been done in my high school years? I need to be a part of that change. I need to be a part of that. So, so that was my, that's why I got into it. Right. But then when I started to engage um, with my, you know, community work, it just made sense. Right. I mean, it just made sense. And so that's my why I'm constantly motivated. Um, because the work is not done, right. There's still conditions inside of the community that has to be fixed. You know, our students are not leaving, you know, uh, with uh, these, these halls, uh, our schools without the proper, uh, you know, diplomas and accreditation, you know, to go out there to to make a life for themselves. And I think we can do better with that. So that's why I'm sticking with this game, you know, because, you know, to me, education is the last institution inside of our community. And I'm going to speak about the, um, you know, the inner city, the black community, you know, the hood, whatever you want to call it. The, the schoolhouse is the last place where the children can go in order to receive that guidance in order to receive networking opportunities, in order to receive, you know, character development, like you said, like, like we are shaping a whole generation from K 
to 12. You know, that's what we do, you know, and if we don't do this right, you know, you can see, well, well, for me, if I don't do this thing right as a principal of Lincoln High School, I can see the conditions in my community never changing. Mm. That's the way, like, I, like, you know, I kind of look at it. Um, and it's a huge responsibility. So, like, I'm just not comfortable with where we're at right now inside of our community. And I think we have to do more, you know, in education. So, so, so that fuels me, you know, that gives me my, you know, my fire, you know, every day <laughs> you got to bring that to the yeah. schools every day and, and staff and everyone else kind of leans on that because they can see your work. Like people see me in a couple of uh, places, like they'll see me in the schoolhouse. They'll see me in the community, you know, serving. They'll see me in city hall fighting for funding and all the rest of those things. Like I, I need to be everywhere. Now it's exhausting, you know, a little sacrifice for the family. You know, my wife is very supportive of the work. You know, but that's the reason why I do this. Hey, I love it. And I, I, I wrote down something you said that resonated. And, and, and I want I want the audience to hear it again. When you said, if I don't do this right, and I'm paraphrasing the community, the community can't grow. The community doesn't benefit from what you do in the school if you don't get it right. And and, and I agree with that because because the, the, the school is not some isolated entity from the community the school is where the children of the community attends uh, receive their education so here you are the leader of that facility the leader of that community and as you said i therefore have to get it right so to the leaders out there the aspiring leaders out there the assistant principals out there who want to become principal principal gaston said as he opened up you know he doesn't do it for the glamour of it you know, the title of it, it's, it's the work, it's, it's, it's the servanthood, right? So here, if you don't have that mindset that there's a correlation between what you do as leader and the growth of the community outside of the school, you, you might want to go here. You might want to check yourself and figure out what is it that I need to do differently, that there's a, there, there's a symbiotic relationship between my performance in the school and what happens outside of the school, right? So, so, so then, therefore, when you consider Gaston, all the reasons that you may have wanted to become a principal, is there that one that you say, you know, I, I want to be a principal for this reason, that reason, this reason, that reason? But is there that one that you said, but this is the reason? See, I had a this is the the reason. Did, did you have one of those? Yeah, because, you know, in the classroom, you know, I mastered the classroom, man. I'm teacher of the year, I do all the other stuff, whatever, right? So the classroom was no problem. You know, I love the classroom. I sometimes I think about going back, you know, but because I just love that relationship. I love the connection, right? I miss but, but, you know, but in order to affect change, you have to be a decision maker. You have to be the person who takes the helm and to, you know, I always said, I want to buy that. You know, and somebody's telling me all the time, oh, no, we can't afford it because it's not in the budget. No, I want to be in charge of the budget. You know, I want to be in charge of just all the things so that I don't have no excuse that why this can't get done. You know, because those are the things that as an educator, like, you know, a, a classroom teacher, you always saw those kind of like restrictions and, you know, the, you know, buffers of, uh, you know, bureaucracy and things like that. So I just wanted to see what that looked like. So that was my main reason. I wanted to be the chief number one decision maker, you know, I, and, and it's absent of my, you know, ego and pride. I wanted to see how resources can be um, used to make somebody else's life better. It's almost like Robin Hood. You know, you want to take the, the millions of dollars, whatever, that's an education to make sure that somebody else is blessed by it. And that's namely the children that's, that's inside of the building and to help teach a practice. Because, you know, a lot of times, like you never want to say, like me, I don't say I don't say no, whatever, when it comes to professional development for teachers. I don't say no when it comes for like the buying of computers or just doing this, that, and the third. If you need it, I'm saying yes. And mm -hmm. if I got to move stuff around in the budget to make sure that you get it, yes. then so be it. So, th so that's my chief reason why. Like, I just wanted to be that chief decision maker to help somebody else to be blessed. I love it. I love it. And, and I particularly love it. I know there's a lot of teachers out there who are either, either on live or we'll see the video later who is saying, that's my kind of principle. 
you know, that that principal that looks out for me professionally, that, that understands my professional needs, which includes if, 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 it's, if it's some kind of an expenditure, he'll do whatever he has to do, whatever he can do to um, to provide. Right. And that's you know, that's that's a lot of times that's all the teacher really asks for. Just just having a principal that supports me mm-hmm. in my work. So before we get to to our the body of this this conversation with Dr. King, I got two more for you. You know, we're we're in the age of COVID right now. You know that you know it better than I do as far as being an educator because you're in the belly. Right. So, you know, remote learning and, and, and the challenges with that. Um, or even in-person learning and the challenges with that as well in terms of protocols and attendance and all that kind of thing. So, you know, there, there, there are educators out there and I, I talk to them, you know, I run my mouth with educators literally six days a week. And, and, and the prevailing word, the word that everybody is using, and even after coming from this break, is the word exhaustion. Everybody's <laughs> exhausted. Every, I don't care what state I'm in, what state is on my screen or what state I'm physically in, everybody's exhausted, right? And I understand it. And they've told me, some of them said to me, this is this is a different kind of exhaustion. This is not the kind you get eight hours sleep and you good. This is, this is something you wake up exhausted, right? After getting eight, 10 hours of sleep. So, so, so my question to you is, what might an exhausted, overworked AP or principal <clears throat> do toward sustaining a sense of balance in their lives, professional, personal balance to to sort of alleviate some of that exhaustion that that one may feel at the school level. I just think that, you know, um, it's the reason why, like understanding your why, you know, because that's the that's the thing that's giving you the extra oomph to drive in things of that nature. So, like, I just think that that's very important because during this pandemic, you know, we're remote this week, we're out, you know, kids had a whole year, whatever. There's a lot of things, whatever that's taking place. A lot of skill deficit that's there, this, that, and the third. So when you, so, so, so as a leader, you just got to say every morning, I'm coming here to do this, that, and the third. We face with a lot of challenges, man. Like it's a, you know, teacher shortages, this, that, and the third. I mean, high absenteeism because people are, have contracted, you know, the um, the virus. So like, it's just every day is something new. Every day is something different, you know, but you just have to stay encouraged. You just have to stay, you know, self-motivated. You have to find some time for yourself. You know, you have to have that quiet space. You have to re- be reflective. You have to read. You have to feed yourself because if you're empty, you're giving people emptiness. Mm. So you're going to have to, and, and emptiness is, um, it, you know, emptiness is infectious, you know, then people start, you know, dropping off and stuff. But if they see you um, taking the helm every day, you're there, you're present, you know, and in this day and age, you can't be a sideline in the office absent leader. You have to be right there in the presence of your children, in the presence of your staff, because because, you know, and you got to be encouraging. You got to you got to be loving and, and things like that. You can't be no harsh, you know, uh, administrator who says, I need I need that y'all going to do it. No, no, no. If you do that, you're going to kill your staff and you're not going to have anybody in your building. So and everybody else it's not just leaders feeling the exhaustion. It's the teachers that are feeling the exhaustion. Yeah. And ultimately, our students have been bombarded. Like we took away socialization during this period. We did this. We did that. And now. Our children, emotional state, man. So we like, you know, a lot of times people, you know, trivialize social emotional learning. um, But you really have to be like checking in with your children. You have to um, ask them how they doing. You have to build relationships. And a lot of times, you know, like like last year or so, we haven't seen our kids like my my freshman and my 10th grade class. I haven't seen them at all. But I've done this pandemic, you know, prior to this year. You know, so we just have to know what the why is and we have to do those things to build ourselves up because we're going to get through this. Like we're going to be out. And and when we come out of this, how are we going to look? You know, we're going to look all beat up and tattered and everything else like that. Or we're going to look like a bunch of resilient people who learned a lot and can use um, different ways. We got tools. We can do things because we've you know, we made it, you know, out of this whole mess whatever that we're in right now yeah that yeah. makes sense. 
It makes a lot of sense. And, you know, you you just said, you know, you, there are two classes, and I talk about this all the time. There are two classes you hadn't met in person, you know, when you talk about your freshman and sophomore, right? And I, and I, I often talk about that seventh grader that went home in 2020, in March of 2020, and, and didn't return back to school until this past fall yes. as, as, a, as a freshman in high school. Or, or that or that um, eighth grader that went home in March of 2020 and didn't return back to school until he or she was a sophomore, right? So, so I mean, that's every time I say that, and I, I must have said that now a zillion times, but every time I say it, it's still mind boggling that, that, that a youngster could be at home as a seventh, go home as a seventh grader and come back as a freshman or be at home as an eighth grader, come back as a sophomore, and now you, the principal, are just meeting that youngster. So that, you know, you could have met him, obviously, on on, on, on a social media pla or a virtual platform, but that's not the same thing as being in that auditorium, right? That's not the same thing as being in them hallways, right? And being in that cafeteria and having that kind of interaction and, and helping that youngster to become acclimated to this new environment. So I feel mm -hmm. for this generation of children. I really do. So, so, so with that, there's an AP perhaps on this call right now or a principal who's in their first year. Remember that first year? Because I, I remember mine vividly, right? <laughs> so, so in their first year, but their first year is in the midst of a pandemic. And, and, and that person is probably at some point going through these levels of frustration, anxiety, looking at the at the resume and like maybe i need to do something different even though this was their why this was their passion but because i entered during this era what words of wisdom what words of inspiration and encouragement might you give that person that could be watching us live right now who's a first year principal first year assistant principal who's at their wits end and ready to try something else as opposed to staying here what you got for them i would just say stay the course because we're going to get through this, you know, stay the course like your children need you. Your children need you. The same um, thing that's inside of you. Right. Your passion, your, your your intellect, your your expertise, like wherever, like whatever that's in you right now, that schoolhouse needs you. And uh, don't think that you labor in vain. Like the nuggets and the and the, and the things that that you're dropping and your service and how you are in those classes, every computer that you give out during remote, all that stuff, people are remembering that they're remembering how you're serving during this time of crisis. Don't give up because they, we are going to have better days in education. You know, I've seen the pendulum kind of like switch, you know, back and forth, whether it be AYT, no child left behind this and that. Thing. Education is a, a cycle of continuums right now you're in the roughest patch right now you're in that patch but in a couple of years we're going to be through this um and just know that the schoolhouse that you're at right now don't leave it or to abandon it like perfect it work on systems work on programmings get creative inside of this right now because those same programs and initiatives and things like that those would be the things that will be sustained uh, when we get through this. So don't give up at all. You know, you're necessary. You're valuable. Your parents need you. Um, your children need you. Um, th the community needs you. Because I said it before, like I said it at the beginning, we are the leaders inside of the community. Like there's many a days I'm saying to myself, well, what it look like, whatever, outside of Jersey City or what it look like outside of Lincoln High School. And then I get zapped back because, number one, the work is not finished. And number two, like, I don't want to disappoint anybody. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to let anybody down. And it's that personal connection um, that that kind of like keeps you. So if you have those personal relationships in the building, you see that little uh, youngster every morning, like, good morning, good morning. Like that person needs you. That person is relying upon that interaction every day. So it's the little things that matter to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, I feel guilty if I abandon, you know, um, abandon my house. Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? Like, it's so don't give up. Like, it's going to get better. That's it. I appreciate that. Somebody, somebody out there need to hear that. You know, I don't, I don't typically do shout outs during when I'm once we're into the message, 
But when I say a Wayne Stackhouse, right, you don't know Wayne, I don't think. But uh, but this 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 young man here, I was a building based sub back in like 89 in East Orange. And he was one of the students there in eighth grade. I went on and hired him as a teacher when I was a principal. Right now he's a pastor and he's on the East Orange Board of Education. So, so stack, you know, I haven't seen you on this broadcast before, but you know, I gotta, you know, like, 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 like Motley says, I stop for royalty, right? So I gotta stop for royalty and, and shout you out, my brother. Good to see you. Look here, let's transition into Dr. King, y'all. Um, I, I, we, we got a lot here. Look, it's King Day. Hang out with us for a while. I'm, I'm not gonna be done by 12. I'll tell you that right now, right? <laughs> so, uh, just, just, just hang out with me. Let's, let's do this. Let's do this. You know, First and foremost, Dr. King, you know, there's so many biographies on his life. There's movies, there's videos, there's documentaries, there's blogs, there's articles, there's, there's, you know, and and so forth. And then obviously classroom lessons and instruction. But as I always say, and the one that really put this in my ear in a big way is an activist here in, in Jersey who's leading a march literally right now, Larry Hamm. Yes, and and and, he, and I kept listening to him over the, the decades. The children have to know Dr. King relative to his writings, his writings, his writings. Dr. King has four books. And I'm going to put them on the screen. Stride Toward Freedom, which was the book on the Montgomery bus boycott written in 1958. This is an important read, folks out there, not just for you as the leaders or the educators of the various capacities on the call, but ultimately your students. Secondly, Strength to Love, which is a compilation of sermons that he put out in 1963, Strength to Love. One of my favorites of the four, 1964, Why We Can't Wait, which was written right after Birmingham. And um, in, in, in particular of, of particular importance, Letter from a Birmingham Jail is in here, which I literally read to one of my schools. I, I read just about the whole letter one day. That means we were in the auditorium for a very long time. But I had maximum 100% attention because they got into the message. And then I guess my favorite, which is the one I'm going to use today, where do we go from here? Community or Chaos, written in 1967 in Jamaica, Ocho Rios, Jamaica, took a vacation, isolated himself, cut off the phone, no phone, and wrote this book, which is a gem, right? So again, first I'll say to my audience this morning, our audience, if you haven't read the four, then then please do so. That's right, Brother Ham, People's Organization for Corrupt Progress. He's right in Newark right now, leading that march in 13 degrees, right? So um, get your hands on them, but then also think about how you infuse that into your school, into your language arts curriculum, into your social studies or history curriculum, whatever it what, whatever it is, so that young people have a better understanding than the sound bites that are um, on the news, and particularly around I Have a Dream. So that's, you know, as, as when we talk about leadership, that's a part of your responsibility. So let me let me jump into it here. The way, just so you guys know out there in, in StreamYard land, the way I set this up today, um, I'm literally going to take passages from this book. And then my guests, Principal Gaston and I will have a conversation around them. And I want you guys to write in the chat, fill up, fill the chat up. You know, I, I said I will be watching football today, but that's not till 430. So between the time we get off and 430, I'll be reading all the comments on all four of the platforms. So hit the share button, hit the retweet button, let them know we're getting ready to get into this. So so so, Chris, let me read this to you. Uh-huh. This is from Where Do We Go From Here, page 44, a profound portion of a paragraph. Dr. King said, I wept. When I say wept, W-E-P-T for the folks out here, so I cried. So I wept for my children and all Black children who have been denied a knowledge of their heritage. Let me read that, that one sentence one more time. I wept for my children and all black children who have been denied a knowledge of their heritage. I wept for all white children who through daily miseducation are taught that the Negro, in this case we'll use African-American, so taught that the African-American is an irrelevant entity in American society. 
I wept for all the white parents and teachers who are forced to overlook the fact that the wealth of cultural and technological progress in America is a result of the commonwealth of inpouring <laughs> contribution. Yeah. Now, before I throw my question at Principal Gaston, I'm going to say to all of you, mm-hmm. it's not the kind of content that we typically get exposed to regarding Dr. King. You got to search for that one. You got to read for that one. You got to go to the books he wrote. He's yeah. talking about miseducation. We don't typically, typically associate miseducation with Dr. King. We talk about struggles and, and protest and march and his positions on various different things. But here he said, Black children, white children are being miseducated and white teachers and parents are victims of the same process. Mm -hmm. With that being said, my question to you, Gaston, what what are your thoughts on this quote relative to what and how we expose children to history? Well, you know, it sounds like Dr. King is a big proponent of uh, critical race theory, right? So that's a that's a whole narrative right yeah, there. That's right. Right now. Right. And he's saying that it's beneficial for everybody to understand the importance of our history. And, uh, you know, that's that's hugely important. You know, one of the things, you know, I have the best social studies uh, department in in Jersey City, uh, probably a state of New Jersey. Uh-huh. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of the things, whatever, that I challenge them and they challenge me on is like getting out. And this pandemic has really hurt uh, us with, you know, with field trips and things like that. But, you know, right now we have, you know, woman of the movement on. We got Emmett Till, whatever, being on every night, uh, every Thursday night. Right. And oh. so it was an honor, whatever, for my students. Right. To actually meet Reverend Wheeler. You know what I'm saying? So like. It's always kind of like connecting these experiences and kind of like having the students understand um, their their position inside of this continual of struggle. Right. And that's important because if I mean, how are you going to fight against resistance or how are you going to know how to shift and move? And, and how are you going to know your role in society if you don't know your history? And so that history is powerful and it's important. Right. So. um we have to give green lights uh, in the classroom for people to stretch that a little bit. You know, you know, in New Jersey, you know, we have the Amistad Commission and everyone has to infuse a little bit of this, that and the third. I, I, I would hope that a whole lot of it um, inside of the all curriculum um, inside of th- that we teach. But you got to feel comfortable enough to actually engage in that. And we got to give um, uh Folk, all teachers really PD, black and white, everyone, so that they can feel comfortable enough to to talk about the history because this history is uh is sad at times, it, it, it's raw, it's real, it's upfront, and we can't scratch the surface on our history. You know, we got to give people the truth because they're going to be living those hard truths in years to come, and they're going to want to know why, H- how do we get here, you know, and that narrative has to be. Um, articulated and thoroughly explained so that our children can prosper. Yeah. All children can prosper. Uh, America can prosper. Over the last two years, like that's really been the conversation, whether it be Black Lives Matter, whether it be critical race, whether it be all these things that are coming out. People are saying that it's high tide now, it's high like right now at the time for truth to be um, given. We, we need truth. Right. And, and because truth is going to prevail. Yeah. Right? You can't hide and deny truth no more to our children and to society. Can't can't hide it. It's, 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 you got to tell it. And, and it's, it's interesting because in today's times and you, you think about May 25th, 2020, the murder of George Floyd yep. by a Minneapolis police officer over a period of nine minutes and twenty nine seconds. That changed everything because young people want information, right? Young people are craving to to, to know more than the sound bites. So, but, but the problem is if we as a staff or we as a district, either politically, we don't want to give or offer the information or we just don't have the the, the knowledge base, then we're not even in position to give the students what they need. So that's why, for example, a platform like this would be created and then the other one, School Talk, so that 
I can talk to educators so that we collectively, because it's always guests, talk to educators about the need to expand upon what you know. Yep. The master teacher is not going to complain about a curriculum because the master teacher knows much more than a curriculum will ever have. The master teacher said, OK, like the, the, just just a simplistic example. The master teacher, the curriculum said Thomas Edison invented a light bulb. But the master teacher said, no, that's only a portion of the story. These are Lewis Latimer light bulbs. Right. So the master teacher doesn't worry about that. But the challenge to us. Are we going to strive to be that master teacher that ensures that learning in the classroom is culturally relevant and those relationships are culturally relevant? responsive let's 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 keep going i got a lot more here so all let me, matter of fact let me just read this passage here it's a long one y'all stay with me dr king the history books which have almost completely ignored the contribution of the african-american in history again he said negro because it was written in 1967 so the contribution of the african-american in american history have only served to intensify the African-American sense of worthlessness mm -hmm. and to augment anachronistic doc doctrine of white supremacy. All too many African-American and whites are uh, unaware of the fact that the first American to shed blood in the revolution which freed this country from British oppression was a black seaman by the name of Crispus Attucks, March 5th, 1770. African-Americans and whites are almost totally oblivious to the fact that it was an African-American doctor, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who performed the first successful open heart surgery in America. And that another African-American, Dr. Charles Drew, was largely responsible for developing the method of separating blood plasma and storing it on a large scale, a process that saved thousands in the lives of World War II and has made possible many of the important advances in post-war medicine. Lastly, history books have virtually overlooked the many African-American scientists and inventors who have enriched American life. That's a lot there. That's a lot. Of course, had he written this in, in today's times, he probably would have had a whole lot of other names in there to throw in there as well. But, but my question to you, although the, 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 the focus of the virtual AP Leadership Academy is APs and, 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 and principles, that watch that watch the live stream or watch it on the video. I, I, I want to say this in terms of everybody. To that end, what can a school leader do to ensure that all students are being exposed to the fullness of American history? Right? Because mm -hmm. see, I, I, I'm at a, I'm at a point. I'm gonna interrupt my question real quick. I'm at a point in my life, my professional life, and my personal life where I don't use the term black history too much these days. And the reason is because of the critical race theory hysteria. Yeah. So with the critical race theory hysteria to legislate African-American history out of curriculum, because that's essentially what it is. So then I'm saying, well, hang on. I'm not talking about African-American history. How about that? I'm yeah. talking about American history, but the component of it that happens to be black. Right. So in other words, I'm saying I'm, I'm still I'm talking about your and my our story. But the part that has been marginalized, compartmentalized, trivialized um, or, 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 or whatever. So I'm calling it American history. And let's tell the fullness of the story. So with that said, let me read my question again. What can a school leader do to ensure that all students are being exposed to the fullness of American history? which is actually, nah, I, I, I wrote a typo here, African-American history, which is actually American history, as opposed to a narrative that excludes the existence of the African-American or reduces him to an afterthought hmm. in history. An afterthought in history. Wow, that's powerful. Um, you know, they got to do what you did, you know. I, I got to give my... Um, educators the flexibility like you know when, when you write in curriculum uh here in new jersey and you getting into some good trouble <laughs> good trouble i think you got I think you got some good trouble in the early 2000s i got into some serious good trouble you got, you got, you got, 
lot of trouble. And, and, and you know what? And, and, and let me just shout out James and Tume real quick because, mm-hmm. you know, he, he, everyone knows, most people know that he, he made his transition the other day. Mm-hmm. But, but without James and Tume, I don't know where the course of my professional life would have gone. Wow. He, yeah. His intervention on that radio show, that changed the course of my history. Let me let you keep going. No, and that's important because, you know, while everybody were in state legislators were talking about Armistad commissions and everything else, you were basically saying at that time, it's it's very important to have these students have knowledge yourself. We got to build up community. And, and the way we do that and to build human beings is to build their knowledge of their history. And that was just like so resonated. And as an early educator and um in New Jersey and, 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 and following you, seeing you on the news at that time, because we shared mutual friends, Alvina Gaston and Corinthian, yeah. seeing you at the church. Um, and I was like, yo, this is what it's about, like being fearless, you know, and not and not being scared, whatever, to to kind of hide this. Because at that time, I was a social studies teacher and I was like, now, listen, I can tell you this, but, um, you know, it's not in the curriculum because at that time we got to teach to the test and we got to do chapter, chapter, chapter. I was like, these kids were hungry for them. And when and every time we gave them them, they appreciated that they, they, they did every essay. They did everything that you asked them to do. They did every report because they were just only reflecting upon them. So so me as a leader, I got to make sure that, that I, I allow teachers to be flexible. Um, I give them the training when they, when they're not comfortable. Like I work with a phenomenal social studies uh, supervisor, Melissa DeSantos. I know we like you know I ain't no name dropping today, but she That's does a phenomenal nice. she does a phenomenal job with the social studies department. Um, uh, I mean, having yeah, I mean, this past year we had uh, Professor Jeffries from um, Ohio State University. He came and spoke to all of our social studies teachers. He was talking the same thing that we're talking right now. I saw that too. That was phenomenal. Let me tell you something. It was powerful. It was probably one of the most powerful PDs that we had this year. All right. And that's the type of stuff that we got to do because in teaching this history, we got to prep people for, to do it. Because a lot of times, see, even though you're black, you may not be conscious. Yeah. And it takes a certain level of consciousness for you to actually step into that realm. See me, I was comfortable in, in stepping into that realm because that's because that's how I'm trained. And, you know, like that's how that's how I study. Like I'm history. I, I, I got I got a mind in Africa, Afro studies. I got this, that and the third. So like I'm ready. I'm ready to give you Benjamin Quarles. I'm ready to give you, you know, all these contemporaries to share a little excerpts with you. But a lot of times people are not don't have the knowledge base. They wasn't tra- like in college, you know, they wasn't trained up on it. They wasn't trained with a with our black intellectual thinkers, whatever at that time, Ben Jacob and uh, Sertima and all the rest of them. Like, like they don't have that knowledge base. They didn't read those books. Right. right. So we gotta give them th- those experiences. That's right. You gotta make them aware of them books. That's why I try to keep that book list active that I have as well, of um books of um of African-American authors for educators of African-American children, because a lot of folks don't, they don't know the, the, the Dr. Ivan Van Sertimus, the Dr. Yosef Ben Yakinins, the Dr. John Henry Clarks, the Dr. Chancellor Williams, the Dr. Sheck Anta Diop, the Dr. John Jacksons of, of the world. And I could go on and on the, the George GM Jackson, the J.A. Rogers, you wow. know, they, 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 they haven't been exposed to Carter G. Woodson's, I mean, in Walter Rodney's. I mean, it's it's it's, a, it's just a, a, a roll call of, of, of phenomenal thinkers and researchers in our history. And those who want to lead, whether it be uh, com- community leaders, community activists, or leaders of schools that have black children, you've got to be well read. You got, you, you got to know what came before you. You can't just react to contemporary issues. You got to have that sense of foundation as well. But principal, I would challenge leaders on the line right now because sometimes a district may not know. Like, you know, when curriculums are adopted, they don't know what type of text that they shall adopt also that will reflect what's going on in the curriculum. So if you're in that, if you ever have that space where you can talk to a supervisor or curriculum supervisors or people like that, you can say, these books need to be adopted. Let them read them. Let them, let them dig it out themselves. Like a powerful thing happened over the last couple of years. You know, we got um, miseducation is in the, is in, you know, is in the curriculum. We have, um, you know, uh, Michelle Alexander's book, you know, uh, you know, all adopted, you know, and, and the district reading it. Like you got to present to them the authors and the contemporaries of this time 
so that they can say, you know, that's appropriate. Oh, it is appropriate for our children. It's nothing wrong with that book, but they don't know. So they you got to give them that. They don't. They don't know. One one of the one of the, the high points of my career as a teacher, I was about 35, 34 years or something, something like that. And they had this curriculum, the social studies curriculum supervisor that knew of my work in the classroom. So they decided that they did want a, a curriculum that addressed African-American history and they asked me to write it. So I wrote this K-12 curriculum that entire summer. It was like the summer of 1995 or something or 94, whatever it was. And they said, will you provide a book list for staff? Man, I just took from my whole library. <laughs> just, just put it all in there. <laughs> and, and and I know it's, if it's anybody from East Orange watching it right now, Stack, I don't know if you're still on, but that curriculum is somewhere in that district, right? <laughs> I, I mean, it's K-12, African-American history. I'm not talking about the Sojourner Truth Middle School curriculum I wrote. I'm talking about a district curriculum where I put every book in my library as a resource inside that curriculum, right? So uh, it's, it's, it's go to that social studies department, Stack. It's probably there. Right. I wrote it a long time ago. Let's okay. keep moving. Someone asked me um, what page I just read from. And that was page 42 and 43 from um, where do we go from here? So now I'm going all the way to 205. For those <laughs> of you who have the book and, and are keeping up with me. And um, here we go. He said, Dr. King said, for those of you that may have tuned in late, I'm, I'm in where do we go from here, chaos or community? And here he, he says, schools have to be infused with a mission if they are to be successful. Now, that just that line alone is potent. Schools have to be infused with a mission if they are to be successful. The mission is clear. The rapid improvement of school performance of African-American and other poor children. Ah, let me read that again. He said the mission is clear. Yeah. Okay, I, I got to say this for the people who just checked in. This is not what we typically hear of Dr. King unless you explore his writings. Yep. We, we, we used to, I, I have a dream. We used to have been to the mountaintop and I'm not trivializing any of that. But there's so much more to this man. Let me, let me, let me, I'm going to start over on that passage. Schools have to be infused with a mission if they are to be successful. The mission is clear. The rapid improvement of, of the school performance of African-Americans and other poor children. If this does not happen, America will suffer for decades to come. Wow. Woo! Wow. Tell me he didn't know. Wow. He said, if this does not happen, America will suffer for decades to come, he wrote this in 1967, where a missionary zeal, now, this is this part I love, where a missionary zeal has been demonstrated by school administrators and teachers, and where this dedication has been backed by competence, funds, and a desire to involve parents. Much has been accomplished. Man, listen, I got to read that part to y'all again. <laughs> Where a missionary zeal has been demonstrated by school administrators and teachers and where this dedication has been backed by competence. Not just the zeal, but you don't have the competence to be great. Yeah, have the zeal. Yeah, have the energy. Yeah, have the fire. But do you have the competence? Dang. That's what he's saying. So in funds, uh, a district, state, funds, federal government, funds, and a desire to involve parents, much has been accomplished. But as he ends it, but by and large, American educators, despite occasional rhetoric, to the contrary, have not dedicated themselves to the rapid improvement of the education of the poor. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Yo, this ain't how I have a dream, y'all. This ain't I've been to the mountaintop. This, 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 this something a little bit different here, right? So now, my question to you, I got two out of this one. 
What can a school leader do to ensure a missionary zeal? Right. And see, you know, a lot of lot of time people like I don't like the word missionary, you know, but I'm, but he's not using it in that context. Like that teacher that comes from the suburbs with it, with this missionary spirit. I'm going to save the kids in the ghetto. No, that's that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about that fire that you said I am locked in, fully committed, all in. That's what he's talking about. So what can a school leader do to ensure a missionary zeal in all of the adults throughout the building? That's my question for you. Well, once again, you know, I'm very fortunate to be around a bunch of uh, folks who uh, understand the mission. You know, I work with uh, Miss Natasha Walker, Miss Wendy Danzi, you know, our principals. And even before that, and, you know, when I first came to Lincoln High School, you know, King must have sound like he was writing rising to the top grants. Right. When he was all talking about you got to have this, this, the funds and, and, and the competence and the training. And you might make sure you have the right proper people, because it takes the right type of people to lift a school out of a failing status to make sure that they are successful status. And I remember coming in um, with our team, Miss Shell Richardson Evans and the whole squad. Of folks, you was on like we was a part of the two thousand high schools in, in in the in the country that produced a considerable amount of dropouts, right? And our graduation rate was just disgusting, and uh, you know, on the verge of closing and all the rest of that type of stuff. So it does take a missionary zeal to have people to understand the why. We have to save children lives, and and thirty something percent of your students graduating within four years, it's not going to cut it. It's not cutting it at all. Right. So you have to have people, whatever, on fire, have people, whatever, being trained, have people being uh, the, the pedagogy, how they uh, how they teach. They got to get training. They got to get all those things. And if they don't get all those things, they're not equipped. They're not competent. You know, they're not they're not ready to rock out. So you got to have all of that in order, whatever, for for for, you know, you know, for you to see change, you know, change to occur. You know, so King right there, uh, you know, some people in the, uh, on on Facebook, they said that's very prophetic. And it is prophetic because, like I said earlier, if the schoolhouse, the, which I believe is the last place in the community where folks can go, is are, are not producing success, then we're not going to have successful outcomes economically. We're not going to have people in, in the job market. The success of a community. Right. And this is me going back to my community hat. Right. If you look at any census data and you look at the degrees that people have, that shows you like you'll see higher social uh, uh, median income. You'll see all that stuff take place. You'll see that their children are graduating, too. So education is imp highly important and putting people in positions so that they can make a life for themselves. Yes. It's hugely important because that's what King is talking about. And if the system of education is producing mediocrity, failure, it, the, the community is in shambles. Yes. You know, so that's what he's really saying. And what we have to do as educators, we got to be well equipped to um, to not uh, uh, to take mediocrity and, and to make it uh, success. Yes. You know, and that takes a lot. And and, and so King is right. King is right there, man. Like he's on point. He's hammering it because our children are suffering, you know, by it. We still have income gaps that are um, that are are inside our community in Jersey City right now. Like where, I, you know, where my school is at and where other schools on the south side of the city is like the median income is like thirty five thousand dollars. But you can go downtown when the median income is like eighty five thousand dollars. This is a fifty thousand dollar community like income gap and you can see that in all metropolitan i don't care if you're in pittsburgh i don't care if you're in baltimore i don't care if you're in new york i don't care if you're los angeles you have to improve somebody else's economic status and that has to be done through education it has to be done through education so king is totally right because that's how you take the people who are poor and you and you help elevate their status in life and that comes through the schoolhouse and comes through the systems that we set up as educators i love it now, you, you know, it's, it, it's, there's a question on here. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm probably going to put you, I might put you on the spot with this one, but the, the, the young man asked the question and I think it's a good question. I'm just trying to find it. Um, I don't want to waste too much time searching. Here it is. He said, this is, this, this is a uh, brother that's with us all the time, every week. How, how do you get the missionary zeal out of a burnout, out of burnout and tiredness? So somebody's in the school, it's COVID. I'm burnt out. I'm tired. How can a leader bring that bring that zeal out of that individual? 
you can't do it. Uh, uh, you can't do it through um, forced mandates and things like that. You have to do it. And, and, and during this time period, you have to keep things very simple. You have to keep things very simple. So so you just have to just give them a couple of things to do to ensure that students are successful, because this is not the time to put a lot of things on teachers plates. Mm -hmm. And I know sometimes like we got to make sure that they take challenge and things like that. But we got to make sure that the main thing is the main thing. Mm -hmm. All right. So I would encourage like in order to get that zeal from them. I'm not saying give less to do. I'm just saying be very um, uh, uh, just keep something the main thing like like. Like if it's if it's um, if it's, um, you know, people keep trying to throw this testing in here, but this testing got during the pandemic. Like, uh, yeah, I mean, we got to do it. But Rude. if we're talking about lack of skills and skill like remediation, because when we come out of this, we got to have students feel feel more confident and better. Then we have to focus on standards and we have to make sure that we align assessments and things like that. So we can see growth inside of one particular area that we see, you know. At the beginning of the school year, you probably diagnosed a whole lot of skill deficit, right? Yeah. And so you can't attack all of it at once. And you and don't expect your staff to attack it all at once. Take a couple of things that you want to drill down on that you believe is is the thing that's going to make them more successful and stay there until you see success. Now, when we come out of the pandemic and things like that, and we have more time and people are not as scared about the virus and spread and all the rest of that, all the hysteria of this uh, time period, then you can go back, whatever, to the the big bucket items, you know? Uh, so so I would just keep the main thing the main thing, if that makes sense. It, it makes a lot of sense. And, and you know, I, I'm hearing you say something without you using this language, but, but, you're, but you're clearly saying it. You're saying to set the teacher up for success with little wins yeah right so 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 small wins until we can get to that point you know you think about like if, if i can use a quick football analogy you think about a, a team such as the old cleveland browns where there was no culture for winning it's just if you if you were brown it's a losing team the fans know that but how do you how, how do you get excited about winning if you if you've never experienced winning if you don't know what winning feels like, what it tastes like. So, so the best way to get there, and which is what I'm hearing you saying, is to stick to the main thing, but give me, set me up for these little wins, right? Not the big win. We're not going for the Super Bowl. Let me let me get a little win. Like maybe we'll win one more game than we won last season, right? So these little wins toward a bigger win for that teacher that may be feeling burnt out. That's what I'm hearing you say. I'm just using teacher, it. Or, or or teacher and staff and school community, right? You know, like I could say, like one of my simple things right now is to like, you know, as a high school principal, I'm trying to get students past across the finish line in a pandemic. I'm trying to have people log on, come to school and everything else like that to, to for them to get a diploma. <laughs> that's the that, that's yeah. the main thing. Yeah. The main thing is leaving out with some paperwork so that you can go to a secondary the school you can go to this you can go to that so you can still train yourself that's it and then you know when we are successful graduating the majority of our class then we just basically like oh fine that's a win we give each other high fives and be like well yeah we did that together as a squad i love it i love it i want to stay with that same passage that i read in you know we uh, the first question i dealt with the missionary zeal but now i want to look at the competence of the teacher so the question is what can a school leader do to increase the competence of teachers throughout the building. And, and I, I guess inherent in that question is instructional leadership of the leaders. So what, what, what do we do to strengthen or, or build that competence of a, of a teacher? Because and, and, and let me give you the motivation behind that in addition to what King said. Yeah. Because, because I'm ne I never lose sight of the fact that, that this is an assistant principal themed live stream format. So I got assistant principals on here, and I'm sure that there's a lot of them on here who are locked into this disciplinary role, right? This bus duty role, this cafeteria supervisor role, as opposed to an instructional leadership role. So I never lose sight of that. So that's so, so I want to give you that spirit as you answer the question. So, you know, the AP um, plays a very, a very vital role because you know, the principal is taking care of the macro and drop it down to the micro at times. You know, we you know, we do it all. 
Uh, but the AP, whatever, just can't do those uh, duties. Like th th that person uh, has to be the supporter, you know, has to be the, the, the nurturer of practice. That person has to take the vision of of the whole entire building and kind of like say, well, where are you at with that? You know, what assistance do you need with that? You know, because you just want people to 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 do what's expected of them to do. And you want to make sure that you can uh, train them up to do it. And that's really, you know, what it is like, like, you know, if a teacher has a tough time, you know, with um, classroom management and things like that, well, you have to support them so that they can become stronger in that. If you, you know, your teachers, you know, teachers are starving for resources and things like that, then you have to find a way, whatever, th th for them to get it, you know, because because their practice is contingent upon them having tools and training, right? It's just really the two basic things that a teacher should have to make sure they either improve. They have to have tools and training. Now, if a person um, is not, is reluctant, and 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 don't want to do this that and the third because they're stubborn don't want to follow the vision of this that and the third and they want to become a detriment to teachers then you have to still support them but you still have to document and everything else like that because that person can't be a uh, a burden on children and destroying children's lives that person shouldn't be a teacher and even even in the beginning whatever you got to go like even in the human resource aspect of it you know, during interviews and things like that, you have to see and and see if this person, uh, you know, and I know this is a shortage and this is tough because a lot of times like you try to get the staff to help fill the vacancy and everything else like that. But you got to be very careful, even in this time that you don't take upon someone who's not going to carry out the mission and vision of your school. Yeah. Right. And that's important, too, because that person could come in there and it'll take a long time, whatever, take a year or two for you to get them out and all the rest of that. But you want to make sure that somebody come in there who has a, has a heart for children, um, can, you know, uh, hear, hear them out as far as, you know, pedagogy and, and everything else like that and see if that aligns to what you're trying to do inside of the schoolhouse and, and, and make sure that this marriage, um, you know, comes into play. But a lot of times, like, you may be inside of a school, like, you may be new to a school and you have, like, you know, I call it the thirds. You may have a, a third of expertise, a third middle of the road, and then you may have, like, another third who are just, like, uh, just going just going with the flow, coming to work, and all the rest of those things. And you got to find ways, whatever, to leverage um, the leadership and in, in the teaching core that you actually have to kind of, like, support, um, enrich. The same thing we do with students, you got to do the same thing almost with teachers. You got to support, you got to enrich, you got to provide, you got to do all those things in order to get the type of staff that you want, you know, or, or that you desire or, or that that school community desires. Because it's not just what you want, it's what's best for um, the students in the building. I love it. You know, when, 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 when you were talking about gauging the various different aspects of the teacher, it, it made me think of a statement I've said on this broadcast a million times. And that is during an interview, I have zero interest in reading or, or looking at a portfolio, right? So that, so that if, if, if I even open it, I'm just doing it so that the teacher, so that the candidate doesn't feel bad that I didn't take a look at it. But I don't, I don't need to see that. I, I just want to have a, a, a genuine conversation with you. It's not even an interview. It's just a conversation. And I will gauge out of that conversation if you seem to be somebody that I'd want to work here. And if you feel that I'm somebody that you would want to work with you know, you, you, your portfolio, I'll look at it after the fact, but I don't need it. I don't need it to tell me who you are per se. I want to hear, I want to hear what you, what, what comes out of your mouth, what comes out of your thinking as we sit in that particular interview. But let me, let me, let me, let me keep going. Um, I got another passage. I'm gonna read on 2004, but before I read it, let me, let me say this to you, the achievement gap. You know, um, the day I set foot in a school as a first year teacher in, in 1988, that that terminology was thrown at me and it was thrown at me throughout the course of my career as a teacher and a principal, the closing of the achievement gap, the closing of the achievement gap. And somewhere along the way, I said, no, nah, that's not my issue. My issue is more so what I coined the attitude gap and i'm not going to get into all that here in the context of today but I'm, I'm saying that to say that it was just thrown at us all the time and there's a lot of folks most of us i would dare say who will enter this profession and there's an achievement gap right there and then we'll spend 30 years in the profession 
and retire 30 or more. And that same achievement gap is still a part of our reality. It's, it's, it's like it doesn't go away, which begs the question, well, are we doing things the way we should be doing them? So yeah. before I ask you the question, let me let me let me read this quick passage to you. Um, I'm on 204 for those who, who are going to buy this book or have the book and want to know where I'm getting this from. Um, the task. This is Dr. King speaking again from where do um, where do we go from here? The task is considerable. It is not merely to bring African-Americans to the higher educate to up to higher educational levels, but to close the gap between their educational levels and those of whites. And then he goes on to explain that if this does not happen as African-Americans advance educationally, whites will be moving ahead even more rapidly so 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 for everyone out there so what king is saying is closing the gap is so critical because if we're just if, if we're looking at it where based on data white students those who are at grade level anyway are here and black students are here and he's saying we can't move like this he's saying in in that passage that gap still has to be closed so that we rise together not sure. like this right so with that said in the capacity of school leader, Principal Gaston, what, what are your thoughts on how we close this racial gap in achievement? See, you said something earlier in your statement, how we're going to keep talking about it. If we just look at data from, from every test that um, is administered, whatever, we're always going to see that there's a glaring uh, uh, gap uh, between whites and blacks asians and blacks because asians fare better than even whites yeah. right? when you start looking at achievement data right but i think what king is really talking about right he's talking about like he's looking at it on a macro level he's not just looking at it in the schoolhouse i already said that i work in a, in a community where the um, median income for one group of people is thirty five thousand dollars and then up in the other areas like eighty five thousand dollars well, how do we get to that? See, my, now me and my community activists and me and my politician, whatever hat, there are things done, has been done systematically that have caused our people to be in a rut that they are in right now. And it takes us to dismantle and to break down these structures so that our children can thrive and, 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 and do what they have to do to be successful in this society. If these things don't take place, if we don't address whatever the economic, making sure that they're not discriminated against jobs, making sure they're not this, that, and the third, they can receive all the training that they want. If you look at folks, whatever, who have bachelor's degrees and master's and blacks, they still fare worse than a white person with a high school diploma. And so, so the myth is, uh, like sometimes we sell students that go to college and you'll get this, go to college and you'll get that, go to the trade school and you'll get that. But if you get the trade and you're a plumber, you're not inside of the trade school, trade a union. You're not inside of this. You're not inside of that. So there's, there's, there's systematic things that have to be broken down in order for our children to thrive. So I'm not saying everyone in the schoolhouse or every leader in the schoolhouse has to be engaged in this, in the political process, but it is a be who like like we have to engage on the outside because like I said, the school is inside of the community. So we're gonna have to fight for different things. Like we have to fight for apprenticeships for our students. If we see a thriving business uh, district inside of our um you know city and we're not talking about people coming in to offer jobs and to do this, that, and the third to help alleviate that. If we don't create pipelines where, where students can leave high school, get apprentices, do, you know, do internships and things like that so they can have access to that, I'm only a principal because someone gave me access. Mm. And, you know, the crazy thing about our wealth inside of this country is that you, me, and other people who make over a hundred thousand dollars inside of this um, country, as black people, we're at the top five percent of the wealth. Um, like we're the wealthiest black people inside of America. Mm -hmm. The majority of black people living in this country, and King's talking about economics now too. He's talking about the whole system. 
even till this day, 70% of black people in this country make less than $45,000 and below. It's 5% at the top, 40, 45,000, the rest are considered middle class. And, and the types of jobs that people get who are in that middle class are more so reliant upon either governmental jobs or either being a teacher, being a servant, being something else, whatever that's 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 you know that's paid by either taxpayer dollars or whatever, because that's where our wealth comes from. Our wealth comes from you know uh, your monies, whatever pay and pensions and all the rest of that stuff, right? So that's what we have to dismantle because like that's seventy percent that's at the bottom. Like we're almost in a permanent caste system where poverty is being constantly reciprocated over and over again, generational poverty, because we don't have any generational wealth. So what King is really talking about, King is talking about like a whole systematic because we'll never be on the same footing as our white counterparts as long as the same systems are in play to marginalize us and to keep us in the position that we're in. Now, when I say that, people say, well, Chris, you're making excuses and things like that. I'm, I'm, I'm more so a realist. I'm more so a realist. Like the society that we live in has to has to have a group of people always remain poor because of the type of capitalistic system that we're in. Everybody else is not going to it sounds it sounds crazy, but everybody else is not going to make it. And they're not going to make it because this is how it was designed. Right. We, so, so 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 we have to dismantle some of the inter institutional racism that is inside of employment that is in that, that that's embedded in the american society because if we don't do that our children are not going to thrive talk about it talk about it you, 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 you gotta have a, you gotta have a permanent underclass in order for this this system as presently constructed to work you gotta have it. so it makes you it makes you wonder about what what it is that we're doing in the educational system yeah so if the system is not working so we have to do other things like you know I like looking at some of the school systems or some of the um, the schools that basically said, well, here's our mission. And then they partner up with other people to make sure those kids, th their set of kids are, are blessed. And that's where like our community, right? like say like a, if that charter school opened up with that particular mission, then we'll go on this whole thing of application. There's a waiting list and things like that. But that school got the it factor. That school got it. And people want that because they know if they took advantage of that, then their children be in a better position. And we got to treat our, all our schools kind of like that. You know, one, one of the things I love about your response is how you took what he was saying about this gap, but gave it application to the world outside of the school. Yes. So therefore, that correlation between that gap in achievement and how it impacts lives beyond, beyond the wall, brick and mortar of a school. I appreciate that. And I know the listeners do as well. I got one more for you. One more. Hit that share button for me, folks. Hit that retweet button for me. I got one more to go. And then we're going to do our rapid fire. Bam. Impact questions. Let me read this passage. As a matter of fact, I wrote a note to myself. Let me let me y'all y'all hang with me for a minute before I read this passage. The word equity, because this is when, I, when the passage I'm going to read to you, it conjured up the thoughts of this word equity. Yeah. And I wrote a blog post. I've, I've shared this with you all for uh, for a few times. The blog post is it, the, the title. I can't give you the exact wording, but but to paraphrase it, equity is not a four letter word. It's not the boogeyman. <laughs> it doesn't have a political connotation. It doesn't have a racial connotation. It is just great teaching. That's all it is. So in terms of the way I define it, I say equity is meeting young people where they are, as they are. But I also say it's not enough to do equity. You must be equity. Yeah. It's gotta be your essence, not just a training, but it's who you are when you walk into that room. So with that said, I wanna read this passage. Because when I read this, I said, he talking equity here. He said, the sad truth is that American schools, by and large, do not know how to teach, nor frequently what to teach. I think that deserves me saying again. <laughs> the sad truth is that American schools, by and large, do not know how to teach, 
nor frequently what to teach. The ineffectiveness in teaching reading skills to many young people, whether white or black, poor or rich, strongly indicates, I'm sorry, strongly indicts foundations and governments for not spending funds effectively to find out what different kinds of reading experiences are needed by the youth with various learning styles at various points in their life. Last sentence, while we aim for the moon, we putter around in academic gardens without even a relief map. Mm. Without a relief map. Mm. Whew. That man was talking equity back in 1967. Again, I'm not I'm not making light nor trivializing, but that's not I have a dream. That's not I've been to the mountaintop. See, that's what they show you on the sound bites. Every every King weekend, that's what you're gonna see. Wow. But 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 King, I'm, I'm listen, y'all. Ha hang with me for a second. I gotta read this again, y'all. <laughs> the sad truth is that American schools, by and large, do not know how to teach nor frequently what to teach. The ineffectiveness in teaching reading skills to many young people, whether white or black, poor or rich, strongly indicts foundations and government for not spending funds effectively to find out what different kinds of reading experiences are needed by youth with various learning styles at various points in their life. While we aim for the moon, we putter around in academic gardens without even a relief map. My question to you, as a school leader, how do we ensure that the individuality of each student in every classroom is never lost, which is what he's saying? You know, a lot of times it goes um, beyond uh, differentiating instruction, you know, because like sometimes we use these cold words. And like you said earlier, you know, we have to really get to know our students. And, you know, the master teacher will 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 look at who they have and then say how do i plan to address what they need you know mm -hmm. like like i mean how do i do that and then as building leaders we have to whatever constantly push that we have to say look you have different students inside of your classroom there's no cookie cutter model whatever when it comes to educating our students right so you have to basically challenge like listen this child needs this did you give him that Oh, do you need help with planning for that? Yeah. Because, you know, a lot of times people come with their methodology and they mold and, you know, they teach this one way. They were like, I planned this lesson. I did this and I wanted to get that done. And then, you know, when they assess, you know, they'll see that students are are like 50 percent of the students pass the test. 50 percent of the students can follow me to the next lesson. You be like, well, so stop for a second. So you got to give people to um, especially in schools where you see like this this quote unquote low achievement. You have to say, well, you need to go back and get them and you need to find find a way to help them out because they need you because you can't leave them right there. It could be you. You'll be going to another concept and then they'll be left behind. And, and I guess that's what he's talking about. He's saying um, and then on the macro level. Right. You know what we do inside of our school systems, we um, equally uh, distribute <laughs> dough, whatever, per child and everything else like that. And our schools, like some of the schools we work in that has high need, we need more resources to make sure that the job gets done. And a lot of people don't like to hear that. They're like, well, you know, you know, all, all kids got the same reading program. All kids got access to this. But all, all but there are groups of students that need more, you know. And so equity comes in and says that even though whatever their budget allocation is a it looks more than you, but they're doing more so to help that that population of students that they have. So on a mac uh, on a micro level inside of the classroom, you have to do more than just differentiate. On a, on a macro level, we have to make sure that there's there's equitable funds to help show to ensure that children, uh, you know, get it. You know, one of the conversations that I guess our previous um, superintendent had, she was a she was a big proponent on. Uh, Dr. Marsha Lyles, she was a big proponent on equity. And she was, you know, and, and I appreciated the conversation when she was like, well, I can't treat this school like that. I, it, schools are different. So yeah. I got to treat different you know, schools differently. Yeah. And I appreciated that conversation, you know, because that was important. That was important to know that, like, my school um, is going to get 
the uh, the teachers, the training, going to have the mentors, going to have everybody else inside of the building to help us out because we have a larger a job to do than a um, a magnet school, whatever that has all the scholars that are like all will, all will pass the test and all the rest of that stuff. So equity comes to say that this school needs that and this schools need this, and that's fair. Yeah, because all you're doing is talk when you're talking about equity, you're talking about fairness, yeah. and um, that's important inside of education. That's right. That's right. That fairness. And, and I see so many people are commenting on and making those distinctions between the, the equity and the equality. Um, that's my that's my cousin. I got shout out the fam, Chanel Henry, right in the building. Her husband's the one that designed the, the logo. Right. So, uh, <laughs> my man, Alonzo. Right. Yeah. So. So. So listen, um, Somebody asked me what page I just read from. I think it was Demetrius. That was on page 204, Demetrius. So questions four and five were from page 204 in uh, where do we go from here? So so listen, we we, we made it to the bottom, um, covered all the questions. It's at 1227. And, and before we close out, I, you know, I got my BAM impact questions, my rapid fire. Want you to give me one word or one sentence tops. I had a guest the other day, man, she was giving me the paragraphs, but I, I let, you know, but give me, give, give me the one word. Okay. One sentence max. Okay. Right. Uh, 21 questions. We're going to go bam. Here we go. Is education on the right path for underserved children? Not quite. Can true equity occur in America's schools for black, brown and other underserved students? Not at its present state. Does your work, Chris Gadsden, contribute to the progress we desperately need? Oh, sure it does. Oh, yes, it does. If you could do a reset on your life, would your line of work be different or the same? No, it would be the same. Why do you continue to do this work? Because I love my, I love people, love my people. What fires you up within the work that you do? Impact on other lives. And what do you love most about this work? Children, staff, the people, my school community. I mean, that's what I love. I, I love this engagement, you know. What do you dislike about the work you do? Uh, paperwork. Uh, <laughs> uh, the constant, whatever, nonsense of bureaucracy and just... Um, other people, whatever, not being as um, diligent and uh, passionate about what what's being done, you know, in our school system. I know that's a large passage, but but that's what hurts the most because you'll get drained as a leader uh, when you don't see other people on the front line um, fighting as hard as you. Like that kind of like it makes you feel like the work is off or not at times. But you got to just keep pressing on that and keep working with your passion. But those are the things. I know something about that. What has been your greatest victory in this work? Overall, seeing just people succeed, man, like because it's not about me. You know, it's about somebody else getting the opportunity to do something better with their lives. That's the greatest success for me, like because they, those people come back to you and say that. Uh, thank you. You know, yes, sir. I appreciate it. What's what's what was your greatest mistake? My greatest mistake. I don't have, I don't, I ain't really reflect on that. I don't know. No, no problem. What has been your greatest challenge? The greatest challenge? I don't know. See, you make me reflect, man. I got to go back. That's what these are for, but you got to do it quick. <laughs> no, I, I don't know about the challenge. Uh, the greatest challenge, I don't I mean, mm -hmm. if, if I could speak for you for a second, one of your greatest challenges might be leading through a pandemic. Well, leading through a pandemic or, you know, and reflecting like I'm a uh, principal could like, like, like you're very important to me. And I can remember um, there was a there was a dry period in my life. And I'm going back, whatever, to talk about, like, you know, this right here, this VP, you know, you know, AP Academy. Um, I'm I'm inspiring to be the principal. Um, I'm rejected at least eight or nine times. I can remember in, in one of my times I was frustrated. I even went on social media and I was talking crazy and you were like, Chris, take the post down. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Post down, Chris. And I was like, all right. But then, like, you challenged me and you pushed me, whatever. I started watching the YouTube. I started taking my notes. I started doing all the things, whatever, to become a better, you know, like a better leader. And uh, th- that was very challenging because I, you know, I started doubting, doubting myself and this, that, and the third. And, but, you know, that, I mean, that was challenging early on in my leadership, not being able to have the ability to lead on that level. So I thank you for that. I appreciate you. Keep going. Um, are you proud of your first year as an assistant principal? When I was an assistant principal? Yes. Oh, oh yeah. I mean, I was proud. I mean, I and mean, I was, I, I, it was hard. It, it was hard. It was hard as ever uh, transitioning from a, uh, uh, a elementary school to a high school and then being thrown into the fire. Like that was tough. Uh, yeah, that was real tough. So, yes, sir. That's another. Are you, proud, show. are you proud of your first year as a principal? Uh, yes. I mean, I'm proud of it. Um, but after my first year, then we start a pandemic and then we end a pandemic. And then this is actually my fourth year as principal. And now I'm trying to lead throughout the pandemic. Yeah. So I've just been all pandemic. <laughs> right. That's right. Who inspires you in this work? Um, you. Uh, yeah. Um, my former uh, leaders that I've had, Mr. Walker, um, just, you know, people who helped put me in position. Um you know, just folks who who fed me um, throughout the years yeah, and helped me to get to this position. So I appreciate everyone who's done that. What are you reading right now? Uh, what am I reading right now? I mean, I, I mean it's a combination of things. Um, the Color of Law, I'm still going through that. I mean, I started picking that up again, and you know, redlining and all the rest of that stuff. Um, those are, those are some of the things I'm reading right now and that's just talking cool. about. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. What, what's a book you'd recommend for our viewers? I mean, just a lot. I mean, give me one. Give you one. Yeah. Oh, uh, man. I mean, just to start, whatever. Like, you you got to start off with uh, Carter G. And then, you know, just recently, you know, Dr. Chris Endem's uh, book. Give us that title. Um, Academic. Uh, oh man, the new color. Oh, man. No, the, new one, the new one is Ratchet Demic. Yeah, 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 the new one Ratchet. But before that, white for white folks who teach in the hood, and the rest, and the rest of y'all too, yeah, and the rest of y'all too. You know that book is very important, and uh, it's talking about like how you know how you approach and how you engage. And I love the way he used the analogy. Like there's one section he used the analogy of the church and how you gotta get that response, how you get the, all that stuff out of children. And stuff like that, and talking about being rel- relative and 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 cultural, you know, you know, a lot of times people struggle with being having cultural relevancy, you know. So that book, you know, is an extension to me of Gloria Ladson's uh, book yeah. and talk about, you know. So like that that realm is very important for people to be in right now as uh, as educators. Excellent, almost done. We got what we got here. Uh, five, um, four more, five more. What do you want to accomplish? Now, give me give me your short answers on these last five. Okay, okay. Come on. What, what do you want to accomplish that you haven't accomplished yet? I, me, like me, I want to create. I want to create more mentorship, man. I want to just mentoring of students. I find it hard. Like early in my career, it was easier, and I didn't have as much to do. But I want to get back to that. I want to get back to training up people, training up students, training up men. Gotcha. Well, are you are you satisfied with where you are professionally? Um, uh, yes, but I just have this longing to, to do more. I'm trying to I'm trying to ask God like what like reveal that. But I'm I'm comfortable right now. But there's more to do. All right. What could you say to a viewer out there who continues to face closed doors? Give me the, give me that one sentence. Oh man, don't give up. Don't give up. What could don't. you say to a viewer out there who's lost their fire? Um, <laughs> get it back. Uh, find a way to get it back. Like find a way. Like like go back to your first love. Go back to why you why you started. Talk to people. Read more. Stretch. Reach out to people because you're because you're inward right now. You're losing your fire because you focused inwardly. Now focus outwardly, and that fire will get rekindled. There you go. And then last one. If Chris Gadsden, Chris L. Gadsden, 
was a word in a dictionary, what would be your definition? Loyal, dedicated, loyal, dedicated, black ego. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Look here, we came to the end and I, I want to say formally, I appreciate you. Appreciate you being here. Appreciate you dropping all these gems and wisdom. And, and as I say, when it happens, you you hit it out the park. I got the bag. No, no, I got the bag, man. Hey, 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 wait, hang on. Let me turn this right. Louisville Slugger? That's the way I hear it. Principal Cafele, man. Okay. Jefferson County Schools in, in Louisville, Kentucky gave me this. Wow. Right. So you so you hit it out the park, Grand Slam. If if you agree with me, y'all, give me some fire emojis. Give me some thumbs up. Give me something. Let them know that uh that that, that this was time well spent this morning, this afternoon. Um and with that, uh, there's, I'm sure there's someone that would like to get in contact with you. I know you're busy anyway but um but there might be you might have some time some way somehow i know it's hard because it's hard for me but um how could how could they get in touch with you via social media that type of thing oh social media yeah. oh, I, mean, I mean i don't you know i don't know if you want to put since, I mean, since you don't have that book to sell yet and all that kind of stuff i don't know if you want to put your email out there but you know yeah. that's one you have you want to do it but social media how they can reach you through messenger or dms or whatever oh i mean social look media at, oh look at all that fire coming <laughs> <laughs> oh, your fire is there, you know. Um, so social media, you know, Chris Gadsden, Facebook, you know, you can reach me on Instagram. Um, I'm at uh, at CP Gadsden 21, uh, Twitter, Chris underscore L underscore Gadsden. Um, if you want to shoot me a text and let me know, whatever, 917 363 1489. You oh, know, man, you're putting it out there, all right? I, I put it out there, man. I put yeah. it out there. That's now, dedication, that's commitment, you know. That's no, but, no, but I thank you, man. I, you, you've been a driving force of just positivity and just encouragement in my life. And, um, you know, you know, we need leaders like you to keep pushing, to keep, I mean, to think about it like this, 90, uh, was this episode 90? Like, yeah. you just, That's huh? right. yeah. I mean, you're training up people in the pandemic. Like, you're training up leaders in the pandemic. That is remarkable. That is crazy. But, yeah. you know, throughout the country, like, you're training up a group that's going to say, because of you, I'm in a position to lead, and I'm one of your disciples. <laughs> appreciate that. Appreciate that. <laughs> hey, hey. Well, again, thank you, thank you, and thank you for being here. Hang with me while I do these announcements. Don't don't leave because then we're gonna talk off camera. Hey, folks. Next week, I got another guest coming on. I got guests until May. I'm not I'm not going solo again until May. So I got my man, Carlos Johnson, principal down there in Charlotte, North Carolina. He calls himself Coach Carlos. So join me for Carlos Johnson uh, next Saturday at 1055 Eastern time. Make sure that you subscribe to my principal, uh, principal Cafele Speaks YouTube channel for my school talk. School talk has one thing, effectively educating black children. That is the sole purpose of that new platform which uh, he put my cousin back up here, Chanel Henry, her, her her husband Al designed the logo for that too, right? So uh, that school talk, it'll be, it's not on set days, it's when I can fit it in. So Zaretta Hammond will be my guest on um, January 27th, Thursday night, eight o'clock. That's next Thursday, not this Thursday, eight o'clock. Zaretta Hammond, author of Culturally Responsive Teaching and the Brain. If you don't have that book, by the way, that's one of the books you may want to get. Uh, I'll be keynoting the ASCD Virtual Leadership Summit on the 18th this week. I guess that's Tuesday. Go to ASCD.org and register, and I hope to see you. Join my man, Sean Hurt, on every Saturday at 10 o'clock on Facebook Live, followed by Create and Educate with Dr. Sheikha Houston and Tammy Taylor at 1030 um, on Saturdays as well at Facebook Live. And then Unlock the Middle with my man, Josh Tovar, and the rest of the crew on seven o'clock on Facebook Live on Sunday nights, and then Village Leadership Group with Dr. Roz Gaskins and Coach Williams on Tuesdays and Thursdays at six Eastern Standard Time. Those of you that are, that are new to me and don't know about my twelve books I've written, here are two of them. The most recent, the Equity and Social Justice Education Fifty, and the Assistant Principal Fifty. Both books, you can get them at anywhere books are sold, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. You can go to my website at principalcafele.com and you'll see my past 
eight books. Um, and then subscribe to the Virtual AP Leadership Academy YouTube channel for this so that you can watch all the previous 89 sessions. I don't call them episodes, I call them sessions. So there's there's 90 of them now with today's. And then tomorrow morning, go to my Virtual AP Leadership Academy Facebook page where you'll see my commentary. I write a commentary that's just an extension of the conversation on Saturday. And that takes me to the bottom, your diet, eat well. You got Some of y'all gonna be watching a lot of football today and tomorrow. Eat well while you watch, right? Don't, don't, don't just pile up on all that crap, right? Eat well, get some exercise in. Like those of you in the Northeast, it's like 13, 14 degrees. Now let me see what it is right now. Um, it's 11. Oh. <laughs> it's 11 degrees right now in Jersey City. Wow. So you know you will bad something if you could go outside now and do a mile or two. I, I might. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm like playing with it. You know, <laughs> I, I'm not definite yet, but I might get out there in 11 degrees. I got my gloves here, right? I got them thermal, but I got two gloves. Like it's two right here. I put another one inside, right? Yeah. So now, you know, so we we gonna see. I'm gonna see what I'm made out of next week. I'll be on here talking about I got the flu. <laughs> I'm still here, y'all. <laughs> but, but but I got the flu. <laughs> but I'm dedicated. <laughs> Because I went out in 11 degrees trying to prove something to somebody. <laughs> Yo, you got to be silly sometimes, y'all. You got you got to find something to laugh at sometimes. Some, when I wrote a post last week about that show, Abbott Elementary. Oh, my God. That was funny. Yeah, people were on me like, yo, you got to have a sense of humor. Lighten up. You're in the Stone Age. You know, all, all this stuff because you know, of my views on the portrayal of the principal. Right. Yeah. So people were on. You got to laugh a little. And I'm like, y'all don't know me. Yeah, these are people who they shared me to other people that don't know me. If people that know me know I do laugh. I do lighten up. I do act silly sometimes. But these are people that didn't know me. So, yo, you need to lighten up. You're living in the Stone Age. <laughs> oh, my God. So anyway, y'all look here, y'all. Glad you're here. See you next week. Have a great week. Have an extraordinary week. Have your best week yet. Peace. Peace. Thumbs up. Cock that fist back. One, two, three. Bam! <laughs> I see you next Saturday at 1055. Or I'll see you in, in the cyber world. By the way, some of y'all been asking me to go on Instagram. I got an account. But every day I'm asking myself why. I only have it because people on this thread said you got to get on Instagram. Okay, I'm on Instagram. Now what? The same people on Instagram are on Facebook. So I'm asking myself, why am I here? <laughs> Those pictures. All right, y'all. I'm out. I might say something crazy. Y'all later. <laughs>